You're listening to Brandon Sports Talk, interviewing professional athletes and Paralympians and Olympians. And now for your professional athlete interview and your host, Brandon P. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the Canada Paralympian Paro Alpine skier, Mac Marcou. How are you doing today? I'm good, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to get started in the sport of Paro Alpine skiing? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think uh, I think it all it all would have started right when I was when I was eight years old. I was diagnosed with Stargardt's disease, which is a juvenile form of macular degeneration. And basically, what that means is um, I started my vision started to deteriorate when I was eight years old. Um, eventually, taking all my central vision and leaving me with six percent in the peripheral. So. Um, you know, I grew up in a pretty motorsport oriented background as a, as a young youngster. It was mostly uh, snowmobiles and dirt bikes. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time racing go-karts in the summer times down in the States. And, uh, you know, I got to the point where my vision was deteriorating enough that you know, it wasn't going to be safe to continue to pursue those sports. So my family started to look into sports that we could continue to do together and um, eventually stumbled across ski racing, which, which uh, had a lot of similarities to all the sports I was already doing in terms of you know, going fast, having a lot of, uh, you know, tactical decisions that have to be made along with the technical decisions. So like, you know, the the line and everything like that, that you would learn in go-kart racing would transfer over to ski racing. So we thought we'd give it a go. And, um, you know, within the first, first year of racing in Northern Ontario, you know, I really kind of fell in love with the sport. I raced able-bodied for, for five years, five or six years in Northern Ontario until, you know, my vision continued to digress and then uh, eventually made the leap over to the para alpine circuit in 2011. And from there, it's just kind of <laughs> it snowballed and continued to carry on to today. Of course, what was that like getting to go on to the para alpine circuit and represent Team Canada? Yeah, so for the first couple of years, you know, I worked really hard just trying to earn a spot with the Canadian ski team. I think uh, right off the bat, I, I went to my first para alpine race in Kimberly, BC in the spring of 2011, just to kind of see where we'd stack up against the rest of the um, para-alpine world, you know, we had nobody else to compare ourselves to. So just wanted to go see where we uh, where we fit in and, and, you know, how much work we had to do to get to the top. And we ended up leaving that um, was a Canadian Nationals. We left that event with a couple of medals and had caught the uh, caught the attention of the Canadian Paralpine team right away. So a couple of weeks later, I made my way to my first uh, prospect camp, and we continued to learn as much as we could. You know, we were surrounded by all these people that we were absolutely idolizing at the time. You know, all we ever wanted was to uh, to wear. Team Canada jacket and now we're training with some of the best skiers in the world so um, yeah we spent that whole next season kind of traveling around North America as a prospect for the Canadian team we spent a lot of time a lot of time between the states and Canada just trying to prove ourselves and continue to learn and progress and eventually making our way to our World Cup debut in 2013 um, and you know I think that season we were still not official members of the team we were on a camp by camp basis so we were going to one race at a time and if we did well, we were invited to the next camp and, and so forth. And we ended up making uh, pretty much the full World Cup circuit that season. And, uh, you know, finishing off with, I want to say, four or five World Cup podiums along with a uh, podium at World Championships at the end of that season. So that uh, kind of solidified our spot on the on the Canadian team by, by the kind of, I guess it would be spring of... 2013 and uh i can tell you it was definitely a long road but it was uh it was pretty incredible you know all we could do was taking as much information from all these athletes that we were surrounded by and you know put our nose down and and get to work and i think you know over those couple of years we had the opportunity to do a lot of really cool things that a lot of young athletes probably weren't able to do at that time so we uh yeah we were just beyond stoked to, to finally be able to put on that canadian team jacket and i'm pretty sure i ripped my first kid apart like uh like a little kid on christmas and tried everything on in front of the mirror and was walking around uh like i was 10 feet tall the next day of course at the age of 15 what was it like winning three ib ipc championships yeah you know it was it was pretty crazy i think you know at that time i wasn't ever 
like I guess throughout my whole career, I was never really a results based skier. I was, you know, just trying to go out and do the best I could every day. And I think it's pretty surreal looking back um, at my career as a young athlete where I was racing against the majority was uh, who had a solid 10 years on me. It was it was pretty special. It was spectacular. But I think, you know, my brother and I were both so caught up in just trying to be faster and better than we were the day before that, um, you know, the results kind of got swept under the rug a little bit. We were just trying to, you know, make it to our goal. And at that point, it would have been to make it to Sochi that following year. So we were just, uh, you know, holding things wide open and hoping for the best along with uh, just trying to take in as much information and as learning as fast as we could. As you talk about competing with your brother, what was that like competing with your brother and and going to Sochi? It was pretty incredible. You know, uh, I think for anybody to be able to travel the world, do what you love to do, especially with your older brother, uh, in tow was pretty uh, was pretty special. I think uh, you know I, I wish that um, he didn't he didn't end up getting injured. So what happened was he uh, he got hurt about a week out of Sochi. So uh, we had to bring in a backup guy, to Rob Femi, um, just just before the games in order to in order to be able to start. And, uh, you know, I think like it was a little bit bittersweet being able to, you know, walk through, um, I guess the big, <laughs> there's a, where you, basically when you get to the games before you go through security, there's this kind of like yard of flag poles. And I think that's like when you really realize that you've made it and you're, and you're at the games, but, uh, um, you know, being able to walk in there with Rob was, was pretty incredible. And I think uh, my brother was fortunate enough to be able to be there with us so we uh you know i think we both relied on each other a lot throughout that whole paralympic experience even though we weren't racing together you know i was still looking to him for advice and and uh and looking for him for him in the finish line basically we came down you know we put a lot of work together over uh you know let's say a six seven year period and it was just just really great to have be able to have him there in some capacity what was this training like preparing for your first paralympics and what was that like going to sochi to compete for your first paralympics yeah so the training is is uh pretty relentless i think uh you know, as as you hear from most athletes, it's a full time job. You know, we're we're training all summer long just to get back on snow in the in the fall. And usually, you know, for for our team specifically, we usually return to snow around August to September, and um, we're pretty much on snow until until the games, um, which would be in March. And then, um, you know, we follow up with some more spring camps, and it's uh, it's pretty pretty full on. I think uh, there's not much break time and when I was when I was young I think I was just so fascinated with the sport and almost obsessive about just you know trying to be faster and better than I was the day before and really prove um, to myself and my teammates that we deserved a spot with the Canadian team and I think that mentality just had us you know time flew by when we were training we were just you know so focused on uh, on trying to learn as much as we could and I think by the time the games came around, I hadn't really had time to process what was going on that season. So uh, <laughs> I think by the time opening ceremonies was over, I was uh, pretty much crap in my pants. And uh, <laughs> it was it was hard as a young, young kid. I think at that point, I was the youngest athlete that Canada had in, at Sochi. And, you know, it was it was a um, I'd say a fair amount overwhelming. It's it's hard to put into perspective that it is just another World Cup. It's just another race. But, you know, there's so much more hype built around the Paralympics. And then you get there and there's, there's you know, tons of media and, and the, the mass of grandstands in the finish line. And it's just something we're not used to on the on the Paralympic circuit. So we, uh, yeah, had a little bit of a shell shock when we got there, but, you know, managed to get a grip. And I'm grateful that I had Rob alongside, um, alongside me because he... Uh, he was pretty good at keeping me grounded and keeping me uh, uh, focused on the right things and, you know, trying to alleviate stress any way you could. And we were, uh, yeah, we were fortunate enough to be able to walk away from those games with uh, gold and two bronze. So I couldn't be more, more stoked or more grateful for that whole experience. Of course, as you talk about receiving three medals, what was that like after the games, getting to put on two bronze and one gold? <laughs> Honestly, it's uh, it's still a surreal feeling. I think, uh, you know, like I said, I'd never been much of a results-based skier. And, you know, I think it's pretty hard to put into words the feeling you get when you when you, when you you have the opportunity to climb on top of podium and, and hear the national anthem as the Canadian flag rises above the rest. It's, uh, I don't know, man, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. I think uh, one of those things that just you immediately have this overwhelming sense of pride for, for the amount of work you put in for the opportunity to compete for your country alongside you know an incredible team i think uh yeah it's just it's it's something that's pretty hard to put into words but you know every now and then have the opportunity to reflect on on times like that and just uh i'm forever grateful for 
for those experiences. After your first Paralympics in 2014, what was the preparing like preparing for the World Cup in 2015 and 17 to prepare for 2018? Yeah, so there was a lot of stuff going on between uh, 2014 and 2018. Um, my brother came back after his um, his injury had kind of calmed down, and we we raced another two seasons together on the World Cup, and we're able to. You know, come home with uh, a gold medal on home soil and uh, 2015 World Championships in Panorama. And I think that for us was a really big, a big moment of redemption. I think after after what had happened in Sochi, and um, just to be able to climb on top of the podium on the on the world stage was, uh, you know, I think still to this day is one of the more memorable podiums I've ever had. And and then uh, you know, eventually we we were we I think the following season I was kind of in the middle of a little bit of a growth spurt. I was uh, getting to the point where, um, yeah, so that, you know, I was in the middle of growing, you know, going from a 16 year old kid, to, you know, maybe, uh, maybe a little bit of a, a man at that point. So I was kind of like, like a newborn deer, <laughs> trying to figure out how to make my, my limbs move again. And I spent the whole 2016 season, uh, pretty much DNFing every race, you know, between my brother and I, I think we maybe finished two, two World Cups that whole season and the rest we spent, you know, either on the ground or in the B-net or, you know, just having silly mistakes. And then, uh, you know, at the end of that season, my brother ended up retiring just as, you know, it was time to move on in life. And um, we started looking for a new guide and I ended up starting to work with a gentleman named Jack Leach who guided me right through the end of 2018. And, you know, right pretty much as soon as Jack stepped on board, we started to gain a lot of really good momentum. That 2017 season was definitely one of the, I think the most memorable seasons I've had in my career in terms of just, you know, we were, we were firing on all cylinders. Everything was, was clicking and we were having a lot of fun while we were doing it. Um, we ended up coming out of world championships that season with four out of five gold medals and a, and a silver on the, on the fifth one. So, you know, we having the opportunity to almost, you know, sweep an event like that was, was pretty incredible. And, you know, we carried that momentum right through up till 2018, just, you know, continuing to push ourselves and try and be faster and stronger than we were the day before. For and yeah, it, it carried us very well into the 2018 games. Unfortunately, at the games, I might have uh, you know bit off more than I could chew a couple times. I ended up having a couple of DNFs, but still was able to come out of out of 2018 with a gold and a bronze and and a couple crashes in the mix. So we uh, yeah we had a really good run together that that couple of years. We had a we had a heck of a lot of fun and and uh, you know we were just on top of the world doing what we love to do every day it was uh, it was pretty incredible how did you take what you learned from your first paralympics run to in 2018 making the paralympic team for the second time going to Pichang? yeah i think going from you know from sochi where i was where i was so new to the sport still and still you know learning as much as possible and you know for the most part pretty overwhelmed to you know having that four years to continue to progress and develop both like as an athlete and as a competitor, we, uh, you know, came into 2018 just with a lot more confidence and, you know, just a little bit of a better idea of what to expect. I think the second time around, the, around the, you know, four year cycle allows you to, you know, really be able to reflect on what happened this season, the seasons leading up to it. And then, uh, you know, figure out what you need to change in order to become a little bit more of a well-oiled machine. Um, and that thing carries right over up until 2022. And, you know, we continued to hone in on, uh, on things that we needed to be better at. And, uh, and yeah, we continue to hone in on things that, that we need to be better at. And, and I think, you know, between that 2018 and 2022, we had a lot of, you know, ups and downs over that four years. Jack had retired. I'd started working with a new guide again, uh, Tristan Rogers. And, you know, along with the pandemic, I was dealing with a lot of injuries and throughout that four years. Um, I had, uh, had gotten a little bit of uh, knee surgery and then uh, I had some issues with some herniated discs in my back that, you know, just pretty much consumed that three three years leading up to the games and right about until until the games you know i think i returned to snow about a month and a half before the games and, and hadn't had the opportunity to race in over over two seasons before uh, before beijing so we were uh yeah i think almost right back to that beginning that i guess more similar to the feeling i had when i was going into sochi where we were uh you know a little bit apprehensive still um having not raced in much over that that four year the last four year cycles a little bit nervous not sure where we were going to stack up um against the rest of the crew and uh and yeah we we're fortunate enough to have you know that 
those tools in our bag, so to speak, uh, you know, like being able to direct your attention where it was necessary and try and, uh, you know, distract ourselves from from the reality that was that we hadn't raced in a couple of years and we were just stepping into the start gate of the Paralympics, just hold on and hope for the best and see what happens. So uh, it was... Uh, it was pretty. It was pretty cool. It was a. It was a pretty special experience getting to getting to you know stand in the start gate again in 2022 and being able to come out of day one with a silver medal was um, you know probably it was it's definitely the highlight of the last four years for me. Not as much having the medal, but being able just to cross the finish line and. And, you know, be able to kick out the start gate feeling good, feeling healthy, and you know, finally on the uh, on the downward side of uh, what seemed to be a, an endless climb, trying to get over some injuries. So, you know, it would have been nice to be able to you know keep cruising, but unfortunately, on day two, I ended up crashing and blew my knees. So, uh, yeah, we're back to the back to the grind on the rehab side of things, and it's been a long summer. I've been working really hard, just trying to get uh, trying to get back on skis here this season, and, and uh, hopefully get back to you know some capacity of healthy by uh by the spring so it's been uh yeah it's been a long a long road over the last couple of years what was that like obviously in the your first two paralympics having your friends and family there to support you and see you compete at the biggest stage yeah there's something there's something that's just so special about being able to have your family in the finish line um you know for for me i've never really been able to have my family around other than at the at the paralympic events so um you know it just adds another element of uniqueness i guess around around the paralympics um being able to come down to the finish line and you know give your mom and dad a hug and and, uh you know at least have them there to celebrate with you compared to you know the majority of the time it's just a phone call and being able to just say hey just want to let you know this is how we made out so it's uh it's definitely pretty special and and i think um i was pretty bummed that they weren't able to be with us in beijing but you know at the same time it is uh it's a pretty expensive endeavor for for the family to be able to make it over to the game so yeah i think third time around i was uh i was okay with you know not having them there and um just you know i think by not having our families around, we had to rely on each other a lot more within the team, you know, for, for that extra little bit of support because, uh, you know, much of the younger athletes, it was their first time around the, uh, around uh, the Paralympics. So for us, just being able to, um, yeah, at least share a little bit of our experiences over the previous games and, and try and be there to support our teammates anyway we could. What was that like competing in Beijing and how was that different from competing in Beijing from your previous two? Uh, um, for the most part, it was pretty similar. I think minus the minus all the stuff around the pandemic, it was uh, it was definitely pretty unique um, in terms of having you know the craziest amount of security and and all of the um, PPE and everything that was put in place to you know prevent people from being sick and and be able to compete. That was definitely something that was pretty different. I think is the best way to put it. It was it was pretty crazy seeing uh, you know the measures that were that were put in place to make sure that nobody was getting sick at the games. And other than that, it's, you know, it's at the end of the day, it is just another ski race. It is pretty, pretty crazy to see how much work went into making our race courses. You know, they, they get for the most part on the world cup, we're skiing at ski hills that are already established. And um, I think each Paralympics over those, those four years, there's that sense of, you know, wow factor that, you know, they built this whole venue just for one ski race. It's pretty, it's pretty surreal and uh, it's a pretty unique experience. But uh, other than that, it's, uh, yeah, pretty much just another day on skis. What was that feeling like the first time you received your Paralympic gear and you saw the Argonum symbols on them? Yeah, man, the, uh, the first, I think my first Paralympic kit, I was, uh, I was beyond stoked. I was over the moon. I think uh, just being able to open everything up, try everything on and, and I think, you know, that's when stuff really starts to set in that you're, uh, you're on your way to uh, Paralympics. And at that point, you know, when I was, when I was a kid, that was, that was all I wanted to do was be able to compete in, in Sochi. So yeah, having that, you know, become a reality by the time we got our kit and we were named to the team. And yeah, I think just, just pride is the best way to put it. Overwhelming sense of pride and, and uh, just, you know, being able to walk around, you know, just be on stoke for even just the opportunity to be able to go there and, and give it your best go. What was that like getting to compete against different countries like 
U.S. and Mexico. Yeah, so we uh, yeah we have uh, pretty sure for Mexico we only have one athlete, Harley, that we uh, we compete against, and he's an absolute beauty. But uh, I think you know we it's pretty great being able to travel around. I think when I was younger, it was more so just getting to know the athletes on the circuit. But you know the athletes that come end up coming to the games is pretty much the same athletes are racing again day in and day out on the World Cup. So. For us, you know, we're a pretty strong community in sport. You know, everyone's just hoping for the best. Obviously, there's that sense of competitiveness, and we're and we're out there and we're trying to win. But you know, all you can be is for your competitors when they lay down a sick run. And you know, I think at the end of the day, we're just great. We're grateful, and we're uh, we're pretty blessed to be able to have friends, you know, all over the world that uh, that love doing what we do as much as as much as we do. How does it feel to have Paralympian behind your last name and add P L Y? Yeah, like we were saying before, I uh, I actually had never even thought about adding the PLY or anything like that. Um, I think you know it's pretty it's pretty crazy to be able to look back and and look at that you know I guess different levels of success we've had over the years, and it's uh, it's definitely a pretty humbling um, thing to do when you have when you have the opportunity to kind of take time and reflect because I think lots of us. We end up, you know, just putting our head down and getting stuck in our daily routines. And, and I think, you know, success is something that you have to earn over and over again. I think no matter how well you did yesterday, you still have to wake up today and you still have to, you know, earn that earn that respect every day pretty well. So it's, uh, you know, it's something really cool to look back and be able to celebrate. But um, it definitely just kind of keeps you motivated to kind of put your head down and try harder to, to be faster and stronger tomorrow. How is that feeling like when you received all three of your rings from the Paralympics and you got to put them on and remember those times. Yeah. The rings are definitely something that are pretty special. Uh, I think, you know, for me, I, I wear my ring every day. Um, and it's always just a little bit of a reminder of, uh, you know, for me, even just a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, especially with dealing with injuries over, over the last four or five years, you know, like the reality is, is that, you know, we compete and, and race in a pretty um, in a pretty risky environment, and you're going to get hurt sometimes. So for us to be able to, you know, find those little motivators and, and ways to, you know, kind of build some more stoke and get excited about skiing again is is pretty cool. And I think for me, that's what the ring is is uh, able to represent. I'm sure as I get older, and uh, you know, for then it'll be something that I put on when I'm trying to, you know, dress for nice occasions or something like that. But I'm sure it'll end up in a box in the back of the closet somewhere, and uh, and yeah. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll stumble across it 10 years down the road and be like, oh, yeah, you know, a nice little memory piece. What is it like, obviously, getting to meet your fans and having them ask for your autographs and photos with you? <laughs> um, it's definitely it's pretty crazy, I think, you know, with the amount of um, coverage that, it, you know, as the Paralympics have started to get and the amount of traction we've started to pick up over the last, you know, for me now, I've been 12 years racing on the para alpine circuit, and uh, I think going from Sochi, where I would come home and I had to explain to everybody what the Paralympics even was, to, to you know now, um, you know people are they're excited, they're paying attention, they were able to watch it on TV and uh, and really be a part of the experience with us is pretty pretty awesome. So you know I try to do as much as I can when I when I am around and I can go hang out at you know local schools where I grew up in, in Sault Ste. Marie and stuff like that, and you know talk to kids and uh, get back in any way you can, but. Um, yeah, it's definitely, it's a pretty cool, cool feeling. You know, I think when we were all young, we all looked up to different athletes in, in one way or another. So, you know, hopefully um, if I can provide a little bit of motivation for younger athletes, that's all I could ever really ask for. What is it like, obviously, getting to compete with some of your teammates like Brian, Molly, Kurt Odes, Odebay? Yeah, we have a we have a pretty incredible team, I have to say, uh, um, right from our, our our staff to you know our our wax like everybody everybody our wax techs our coaches our physios um and our teammates were a pretty solid unit and i think um you know there's something to be said about about the canadian paralpine team and and how our program's been run over the last 12 years you know we've uh, we've been fortunate enough to continue to uh you know set the bar and set the standard for high performance both within canadian ski teams but around around the world cup as well so it's pretty special to be a part of a part of this ship and um you know i think we have a lot of fun together on the road and you know we we get to train together every day so being able to push each other um on the slopes and then you know hang out for the rest of the day and 
you know, carry on through our dry land programs and, and stuff like that. It just pretty much becomes a second family. And, uh, and uh, yeah, we have a lot of fun together. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to train and, and be around them that much in the last couple of years, but uh, I'm really looking forward to be able to get back on snow and, and jump back on board with the uh, the World Cup crew. Who are some of the people that you looked up to in the sport of alpine skiing? Oh man, there's uh, there's definitely a long list a list of those. I think for me when I was young, I uh, you know like many kids that ski raced, absolutely idolized our Canadian cowboys and you know like Eric and Manny and and these boys that uh, you know continued to continued to push push progression both in ski racing but we're also you know canadian and felt that little you know sense of connection when we're when we're sitting turning on the tv and just watching them you know ski at kids fuel and, and stuff like that was pretty it was pretty incredible and other than that i'd say them all my teammates as i what are some of your future plans in the sport of alpine skiing oh the future the future for me is definitely a little bit of a, of a gray area right now you know i uh for now it's um i'm working really hard to you know just try and um get healthy and get this knee fixed up so i can get back sliding around on skis and then uh, you know i think for for this season I've become uh, pretty passionate over the last couple of years about, um, you know, spending time in the backcountry and, and continue to push these avenues of sport that, uh, you know, not many avenues or that not many athletes have really navigated yet. So, you know, spending a lot of time in the backcountry, both skiing and snowmobiling. So for this season, uh, my main goal and focus is uh, is on a field program, our project, just trying to, uh, you know, showcase what we are doing in the backcountry and the process behind uh, behind how we do things and how we can you know, keep things safe. Obviously, there's a lot more risk involved uh, in big mountain skiing and free skiing when when you're visually impaired. So, um, you know, just hopefully to showcase the process behind that, and then uh, and then you know, I think after after we can wrap up the film project, we'll see uh, we'll see what time's left in the season to to get back on snow. But I think uh, I'm gonna have to you know be I'm at the point now where I'm gonna have to start looking for a new guide and. Uh, and we'll see what the, what the future holds in terms of ski racing. What was the feeling like living out your Paralympic train? It's uh, it's pretty crazy, man. It's uh, it's something that you know. I guess we're still in the midst of. I think uh, you know, every day when I wake up and and I go to work, whether you know it's a tough day at the gym or or uh, you know days that seem like they're pretty, I guess, crappy or monotonous or whatnot. I think back to you know eight year old me. Who, all I wanted to do was be a member of the Canadian ski team and, and be able to represent my country. So I think it's easy to get caught in the uh, in the monotony of it all, and and you know just get your head down and get stuck in the in a little bit of this cycle. But at the end of the day, you know we're still getting up every day and doing what we love to do. So um, that's all I could ever ask for. What advice would you give those college athletes that are looking to get into para alpine skiing? Um, advice, I'd say definitely just give it a go. Go get involved. Find your uh, you know, local adaptive program. If you've never skied before, if uh, if you've been involved in ski racing, you know, just uh, reach out. Everyone is, you know, extremely welcoming within the uh, within the paralpine world, and you know, we're always, you know, looking for looking for athletes to, you know, come in and and give her a go. I think uh, the more people we can share the sport with, the better. What advice would you give people that are looking to get into the adaptive sports world? Yeah, I'd say. You know, for me as a, as a young kid, it was probably one of the best things I could have done. Um, you know, just being able to to get involved with with this whole community of para sports, it's uh, you know a pretty outrageous opportunity just to be able to you know go in and hear people's stories and and uh, you know I think there's a lot of adversity that's been overcome through throughout pretty much every athlete has been uh, you know through the ringer a little bit in one way or another so having the opportunity to kind of share and bond over that along with you know just feel this sense of belonging in a in a pretty crazy world these days so it's uh yeah no it's definitely uh something that i'd highly recommend um at least giving her a go and and see if it's something you're into what advice would you give those people that are looking to represent their national team whether it's team canada or team usa i'd say it's always a good goal to uh to have to be able to represent your country in in one way or another um you know for for me it's definitely been something that i continue to be extremely proud of and um, when i was a young athlete it was something i was i was pretty fixated on on you know hopefully one day being able to wear that maple leaf on my back and I think uh, I think that there is no better feeling than being able to be able to put cans on your back in, in any way, shape, or form, whether you're on the ski hill, you're playing basketball, or you're uh, you're golfing. I don't know, whatever it works. It's uh, it's pretty crazy to be able to uh, be a member of of a pretty elite group of athletes.
One advice for you those future Paralympians that are looking to compete, whether it's their first time or multiple times competing? I'd say the Paralympics has a lot of hype around it, but, you know, if you can, uh, you know, find a way to remember that it is just another race or another event that you've done a hundred times in the past, uh, it's a good way to kind of calm your mind down a little bit and try and block out all the distractions that are around, uh, you know, such a big event. At the end of the day, you're still playing your respective sport as you did the day before. So I guess if you can train to race and race to train, it's uh, it's pretty much the best setup you can go for. That's great advice. Where can my listeners find you at on social media? Um, yeah, so you can find me for the most part on Instagram, I think is my is my main outlet. Um, and it's just at Mac Marku, all one, all one letter, uh, or all one word, sorry. And uh and yeah, I do every now and then share stuff on Facebook, but I'd say for the most part, Instagram is uh, is my main outlet. Thank you again, Mac Marku, for your interview, and best of luck in your future with Team Canada in the Paro Alpine skiing. Right on. Thanks, Brandon. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Facebook at Brandon Sports Talk Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon. And you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again, Mac Marmero, for your interview, and best of luck in your future. Thank you. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.